From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward Arnold, Fay Ray, and H.B. Warner in The Boss. Lux presents Hollywood. Our thanks to those of you who are expressing your approval of our program by regular purchases of our product, Lux Toilet Soap. You'll find you'll like our product as much as you like our theater. And we appreciate your loyalty. For it is your loyalty to Lux that makes this program possible. In our theater tonight are Edward Arnold, Fay Ray, and H.B. Warner, whom you'll hear in a moment in The Boss. As special guest, we bring you Dorothy Dix, nationally known advisor on love and marriage, and one of the most famous columnists in the history of journalism. Louis Silvers directs our music. The Lux Radio Theater is personally produced by Hollywood's master showman, your host, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Edward Arnold has long been familiar with the role of Mike Regan, in Edward Sheldon's melodrama, The Boss, which we present tonight. As a stock company actor, Mr. Arnold played the role in St. Paul and Utica, where it served, somewhat ingloriously, to take him from the stage to the screen. He arrived in Utica, worn out from two exhausting years of work and worry. He was further distressed by an offer to make silent pictures, which he didn't know whether or not to accept. It all had a devastating effect on his performances in The Boss. Try as he would, Mr. Arnold couldn't get through an act without forgetting his lines. The rest of the cast was frantic. They begged him, they flattered him, they threatened him. Eddie, in turn, promised and tried desperately and failed. At last, he confessed it was the movie offer that was upsetting him and earnestly asked his furious director what he thought of his chances on the screen. I don't know, the director exploded. But if you do accept, you'll be doing a tremendous favor to every actor and director in stock. This appeal to his public spirit so touched Mr. Arnold that he left the stage, became a film star, and fooled his old associates by turning into one of the most dependable actors on the screen. Our other stars are Fay Ray and H.B. Warner. Miss Ray advanced to stardom from Hollywood High School. While still a student, she played extra parts and in turn became a Western heroine, a feature player, a comedian, and finally a star. In our play, she's Emily Griswold. My association with H.B. Warner dates back to the time he became the original star of Alias Jimmy Valentine. When we both came to Hollywood, one of the first roles he played for me was in The Ghostbreaker, in which he was locked in a prison cell with a dozen large rats. The property man was unable to get any black rats, so we secured some tame white ones and covered them with lamp black. But while we were shooting the scene, the fastidious rodents, uh, instead of attacking Mr. Warner, calmly sat up on their haunches and proceeded to lick off the lamp black with apparent delight. <laughs> Since then, he's become celebrated for his spiritual characterizations, starring for me in The King of Kings and recently for Columbia Studios in Lost Horizon. For us tonight, he plays the Archbishop. And now the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward Arnold in The Boss with Fay Ray and H.B. Warner. The tenement district of a Middle Western city. On a side street which comes to a dead end at the riverfront... A limousine is pulled up to the curb. In the back seat is Mike Regan, the political and financial boss of the town. And beside him, his boyhood friend, now his grace, the archbishop. The priest leans forward, talking earnestly. And there you have it, Michael. It's not a pretty picture, is it? Now the whole district and every shanty in it is rotten to the core. I don't know how they live in them. And you see, they, they can't help themselves, Michael. They can't lift themselves by their bootstraps. It's up to us. Michael, when you see what conditions are... Oh, like, wait a minute. Wait you... a minute, Your Grace. I don't like to interrupt, but you don't have to tell me about this district. I know, Michael. You were born here. Well, so was I. 
But it's a long time since you've been back. Now, what do you want me to do? Is it money? If it is, just say the word. Well, money would help, of course, but... but I was thinking of something else. Yeah? You're a big man in this town, Michael. Half the men in this district have jobs at your mill. I was hoping you'd... Well, take more of a personal interest. Oh, now, Your Grace, I can't do that. That takes a lot of time. Is your time more important than the lives of 8,000 people, Michael? Well, it's my time that gives them jobs. Where'd my company be, Your Grace, if I was puttering around down here every day? I can't do it. But I'll tell you what I can do. You want me to help these people, and I will. You just tell me how much it'll take. Hey, there's a girl trying Demi to... Demi get... Griswold. Oh, open the door, Dugan. Yes, Good sir. morning, Your Grace. Good morning, Emily. Oh, don't get out, please. It's all right. How are you, my dear? Well, I saw you sitting in the car, and I just wanted to ask you to drop in on Mrs. Holloway, if you Is could. Is she bad again? About the same. There's no hurry. I'll run in and see her. Oh, uh, uh, this is Michael Regan, Miss Griswold. How are you? Miss Griswold you has been helping us out in Shantytown. Oh, is that so? One of our very best social workers. Well, I, I do what I can. It, it's not very much. I've just been talking to Michael about taking a, a personal interest in things down here. Oh, that's splendid. I'm so glad you're going to, Mr. Regan. Oh, well, I didn't exactly say There's it. so much that can be done. If only people would understand that... That money alone doesn't help very much. Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, that, uh, that, that's uh, just what we were saying. Uh, but, uh, Emily, perhaps you and Mr. Regan ought to talk things over. Why, of course, any time. I have a lot of ideas, Mr. Regan. Oh, well, that's fine. What about tonight? <laughs> oh, I couldn't tonight. Tomorrow? Well, I'm pretty busy all day. But uh, I usually go for a ride in the park before breakfast. You mean a horseback ride? Why, yes. Well, <laughs> it's a little out of my line, but I've always wanted to try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I'll see you then. Yeah, sure, sure. Goodbye, Your Grace. Goodbye, Emily. Well, Michael? She's a nice girl, isn't she? Huh? Yeah, real high society, huh? <laughs> you meet all kinds in social work. Yeah. Well, I... I'm glad you've changed your mind, Michael. Yeah, I... Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you wouldn't fool me, would you, Your Grace? <laughs> oh, you, you won't regret it, Michael. Uh, no, I don't think I will. No. <laughs> Morning, boss. Hello, Ed. Morning, Mr. Regan. Hi. Nice day, boss. Not bad. Good morning, Mr. Regan. Hello, Davis. Out riding this morning, sir? Yeah, I'm getting so I can almost stay on a horse now. <laughs> Hello, Porky. Hi, boss. Waiting to see me? Yeah. All right, Davis, outside. Yes, sir. The mail's on your desk, sir. Thank you. Well, Porky. Well, he's come, just like he said he would. Oh. That young Griswold guy. All right. Did he say what he wanted? No. But I only need one guess. It's probably about them contracts you've been taking from under his old man's nose. Well, what about him? I was just wondering what you was going to do. Well, I'm going to keep him, of course. I got him fair and square, didn't I? Sure. Only I was thinking, you are out riding with a sister every morning. Porky, you're a softie. Business and sentiment don't mix. You know that. Send him in here. Okay. Mr. Regan here now. Thanks. Come in. My name's Donald Griswold. Yeah, I know. Sit down. You probably also know why I'm here. I guess so. Regan, you've been underbidding us on every contract we have. I want to know what's behind it. Oh, there ain't nothing behind it. Except I can sell cheaper, that's all. The Western Amalgamated went over to you this morning. Oh, did it? Well, that's the way it goes, young fellow. They say that competition is the life... This isn't competition, Regan. It's robbery. Yeah? We've had those contracts for years. And just because you pay your labor starvation wages, you think you can sneak in that's and... enough of that, young fellow. I didn't ask you to come here. If you want to talk business, send your old man around. I don't deal with kids. When can you see us? Will you be home tonight? Home? I don't see what that has well, to do with it. I'll be passing that way around 8 o'clock, that's all. I've been wanting to talk to your old man anyhow. Well? I suppose we'll have to be there. Good. Will you have a cigar? Thanks, but we can still afford our own. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Kids got gumption, Mike. Yeah, I guess it runs in the family. <laughs> He's coming here. He insisted on it. I know what's in his mind, Dad. He thinks because he's got us in a hole, he can use us for a stepping stone. Well, he won't. Donald, my boy, there's no use in getting excited. Regardless of what this man Regan he's is... a dirty, blackjacking swindler. Regardless of that, 
He has us right where he wants us, Donald. Those notes, they're, they're due on the first. If we fail, I can't meet them. Those banks will go under like that. We can't take that chance, son. Yes, I know. If we only had time... If I could only get him to keep his thieving hands off the Western contracts for one month. That's all I'd need. Just a month. What could you do? I'd get his men out on a strike. Oh, you couldn't do that. Uh, couldn't I? They're like a powder magazine just waiting for a match. How many of them are there? Over 3,000. And sick to death of being rounded up like steers with a gang of toughs for cowboys. You know why those people in Shantytown can't buy food for their kids? Because Regan pays the men starvation wages and then takes it away from them in rent. He owns the whole district and charges them sky-high prices for living quarters that aren't fit for animals. Are you sure of that? That he really owns that property? Well, of course I am. Oh, he's kept it quiet, all right. He's afraid it might interfere with his social climbing. I tell you, Dad, that uh, fellow... Come in. Yes, Mitchell? I beg your pardon, sir. There's a Mr. Regan to see you. Oh. Show him in, please. Yes, sir. You'll find Mr. Griswold in the library, sir. Okay, here's a, here's a dollar for you. Oh, no, sir. Oh, go on, take it. I'm sorry, sir, but I can't. Okay, buddy, it's your loss. Got a snipe wire, Donald. Hello, gents. How do you do, Mr. Regan? Good evening. Uh, sorry I'm late. Pretty busy these days. Well, this is certainly a nifty layout you got here, Griswold. It's real class. Mm. Sit down, Mr. Regan. I don't want to take up too much of your valuable time. <laughs> okay, let's get at it. I'll go straight to the point, Regan. I've been handling most of the grain that lands in this city for nearly 25 years. But I'm afraid I'm too conservative to fight the conditions you've created. You've beaten me, Regan. Oh, what about it? Just a moment, please. I want to make the situation perfectly clear. For a good many years, I've also been rather prominent in the direction of three important banks. Yeah, the People's Trust, the Union Guarantee, and the Farmer's Loan. Yes. Yeah, and they've put up the money you've been fighting me with. You'll file your bankruptcy petition within a week. There'll be a run on those banks, and they'll go to blazes so quick, they'll never know what struck them. I know. If you take over my business now, you'll shake the credit of the whole state. I don't give a hoot for the credit of the state. I can hang on through any run. Uh, Mr. Regan. But you can. Say, do you know where a run would land you? Right in the county jug, with a steady job as a laundryman washing undershirts. Regan, give me six months before you take over the Western... I have some loans coming in. I'm sorry, mister. Uh, four, then. At the end, you'll get the business just the same. Sure. But I think I ought to make a moral example of you, Mr. Griswold. What? Yeah. What do you think the folks in the Fourth Ward are going to say when they hear that all their savings have gone blah? Sure, there are a lot of hooligans and that wouldn't know a cream to mint from a grand piano. But what are you going to tell them, Mr. Griswold, when they up and smash your beak off on the way to jail? I assumed you came here to talk business, Mr. Regan. I can see it's hopeless oh, now. forget it, forget it. The trouble with you patting other guys is you can't see a joke when it jumps up and hits you in the teeth. I ain't trying to make it tough for you. I was only kidding. Hey, uh, what do you say to a compromise? Compromise? That's the idea. A bunch up of the two firms. You mean an, an amalgamation? That's right. But my mouth's too full of teeth to say it. Well, what do you say? An amalgamation. No, you can't do it, Dad. I've got to think of those depositors. I know that, but he's got something else up his sleeve. He must have. Why don't you lay it on the table, Regan? Yeah, you're a sharp young fella, ain't you? Well, you called my bluff, and I don't mind showing my hand. Mr. Griswold, I didn't care nothing about squaring things up this way when I started in to grab your business. I've been thinking. And right now, I'd like to make up good and close to you, because, uh... Because what? Because I want to ask your daughter if by any chance she'd mind being Mrs. Regan. What? Marry me, that's what. Get out, Regan. Get out and stay out. What do you mean? You heard him. Get out. Oh, so I'm canned, huh? <laughs> I get the bum's rush, huh? Well, let me tell you something, you stuffed shirts. I got you where I want you, and by heaven, I won't let go till you're squealing like a couple of stuck pigs. We know what you can do, and we're telling you to get out. Father, Donald, what's the matter? Oh, good evening, Miss Emily. Uh, go upstairs, Emily. No, I won't. There's something wrong. Will you please get out of here? What for? Miss Griswold's a pretty important person in this business. Let's see what she's got to say. About what, Mr. Regan? Emily, my I dear... I guess I'd better do the talking, mister. Uh, listen, Miss Emily. Well? I ain't seen you more than four or five times, but I'm no slouch when it comes to making up my mind. So here goes. 
I'm 38 years old, never had a sick day in my life. I don't gamble or play the races. And I never got mixed up with women because they've been on the jump all the time, I suppose. And they tell me that women takes up a lot of time. But now I'm getting along and I've made my pile. And I feel like settling down and having someone pour my coffee in the morning. And put my carpet slippers on the radiator at night. You mean... I guess you're wise. I want you to marry me. To get a social position for his dirty politics... Young fellow, I can put this through without your button in. I know you can help me, Miss Emily, and I ain't ashamed to say it. But that ain't the reason I... I want you. Isn't it? No. I'm crazy about you, that's why. Yes, he's offered to buy you, Emily. He's offered Dad a partnership. I've offered him more than a partnership, young fella. I've offered him a chance to hang on to his good name. What do you mean? It's nothing, Emily. No, listen, Mr. Grizzle. Your father's borrowed money from three banks... He just happens to be a director in them, that's all. When he goes bankrupt, they'll stop payment, and Mr. Griswold, the ex-game king, will hide his head in shame. Dad! What's more, those laborers of mine that you're so stuck on in Shantytown, they'll lose every bit of dough they ever managed to scrape together. Dad, is this true? Yes, Emily. But, but they have so little. It means everything to them. I don't suppose there's anything else you'll take, Mr. Regan. You wouldn't offer that partnership on any other basis. No, ma'am, I wouldn't. But I'll tell you what I will do. You take me up on on my proposition and I'll do better than the partnership. I'll give your father back half the contracts I took from him. On the day of our wedding, I suppose. Emily, don't be a fool. I'm not a fool, Donald. Good night, Mr. Regan. You mean you won't? I said, good night, Mr. Regan. Okay. Good night. Who is it? Hold your horses, will you? This is a fine hour to be coming in. May I come in, please? I know it's rather late, but do you mind? No, no, of course not. Come in. Uh, uh, Sit down, won't you? Thank you. I've come to tell you that If you still want me, I'm willing to take your proposition. You mean it? Yes. You mean your father... My father doesn't know anything about it. Ah, I see. Before we go any further, I'd like you to understand one thing. I don't care for you. I never will care for you. No? Well, that didn't seem to worry you before. Oh, no, go on, go on. If I marry you, it's with the understanding that everything... Stops at the church door. Yeah, but you... Those are my conditions. I'll help you with my position. I'll do my best for you that way. But that's all. It's just an everyday bargain. If you want me, on that basis, you can have me. Well? (laughs) That's a pretty sharp offer you're making me. But I'll take it just the same. On those terms? I always take what I can get. And then I always get a little more. You won't. This time. No? All right. I'll take my chances on that. And so ends Act One of The Boss, starring Edward Arnold, Fay Ray, and H.B. Warner. In a few moments, our stars will return in Act Two. Let's take advantage of this short intermission to play a little game. We're going to give you some bits of neighborly gossip about the screen stars, but we won't give you their names. See if you can guess to whom each item applies. You'll want pencil and paper for this. There will be five questions. Ready? A young lady who knows all the answers will read the questions, and at the end of each, give you the right answer and tell you how much credit to give yourself if you're right. Are you ready? Question one. We don't usually associate screen stars with homely domestic chores. But there is one Hollywood beauty who is frequently seen doing her own marketing. Do you know who she is? The answer is, and if you're right, give yourself 15, Miriam Hopkins. Question two. Screen stars, poor dears, are usually too busy on location to go off on a honeymoon. One of them, however, recently determined nothing was going to interfere with her long-dreamed-of jaunt through Europe with her new husband. And off she went. Can you name her? The answer is Claudette Colbert. Fifteen for that one, too, if you have it right. Claudette Colbert. Question three. 
To be included among the first ten box office draws is the goal at which all screen stars aim. Recently, a young unknown came to Hollywood and took the country by storm with her first picture. She is the first woman star since sound pictures came in to reach that enviable first ten spot in the short space of one year. Do you know her? The answer is Sonia Henney. Take 15 credits if you got that one, Sonia Henney. Question four. One of our most charming Hollywood lovelies has two sisters in pictures. Equally lovely, but not as well known. Who are these three little maids? They look alike, too. Did you get it right? Loretta Young, Sally Blaine, and Polly Ann Young. You can have 15 for that one. Loretta Young and her two sisters. Question five. The camera shows up the tiniest complexion flaw. Screen stars must keep skin smooth and clear at all times. What famous screen stars use Lux toilet soap to guard their priceless complexions? I know the answer to that one. There are too, too many to mention. For actually, nine out of ten screen stars use Lux toilet soap. These famous beauties wouldn't dream of letting their pores become choked with dust, dirt, and stale cosmetics. They know that pores choked in this way cause cosmetic skin, dullness, tiny blemishes, and enlarged pores. Lux toilet soap's active lather removes thoroughly dust and dirt, stale rouge and powder, Leave skin soft and smooth. That is certainly the right answer, Mr. Ruick. You can take 40% for it, and so can all the women in the audience who got it right. That brings us up to 100%, and that's as it should be. For Lux Toilet Soap is mighty important to women everywhere. It helps them score 100%, helps to put them over the top. And now, Mr. DeMille and our play. We continue with The Boss, starring Edward Arnold, Fay Ray, and H.B. Warner. Several months have passed. Donald Griswold, roused to fury by Emily's marriage, has been fighting Regan openly. Agitating among the mill workers, he's brought them to fever heat, and the word strike goes whispering through the plant. Walkie McCoy has just brought this news to the boss. They're having a meeting tonight, boss, over in St. Mary's Hall. Young Griswold is going to speak, and he's bringing a whole crowd of the big shots with him. J.C. Tyler, Roland Adams, and the Archbishop himself. The Archbishop? Yeah. And if he speaks against us, we're through. The men will walk out like sheep. <laughs> through, eh? All right. Let them quit. If the Western will stand by me for another week, I'll beat them to a standstill. Oh. I got a bunch of men on their way right now. 3,000 of them. They'll work for half pay. Say, that's great, boss. That's swell. Now, you get over to that meeting tonight and let me know how things are going, see? I'll be home if you want me. Call me anytime. Okay, boss. Lick me, huh? <laughs> yes, they will. <laughs> oh, uh, Emily. Emily. Yes? Uh, I ain't interrupting, am I? Oh, no, it's all right. Here, you're looking swell tonight. You know, I kept watching you at the dinner table and saying to myself, she's got all the other dames in this town lashed to the mast. Thank you. Do you know what day this is, Emily? Day? Yeah, it's October the 29th. Well? Well, think back six months and, uh, you know, well... Oh, yes. Yes, I'd forgotten. Yeah, well, I ain't. So I took the liberty of uh, buying you a little something. Look, Emily, it's a... It's a pin. What's the matter? Don't you want it? Thank you, Michael. You ain't even looked at it. It's a diamond frog with emeralds in it. Look. Here, let me put it on. Oh, no, no. If you don't mind, I... I'd rather not. I see. That's the second thing I bought you that you won't wear. You're certainly not breaking down any, are you? You said you'd take your chances. No, oh, I'm not beefing, but I thought... Okay, Emily, I won't bother you anymore. I'm sorry, Michael, but that's the way it has to be. Uh, Mr. Regan, sir. Hello? There's a call for you, sir. Will you take it in here? Yeah. Yes, sir. Hello? Yeah, Pokey. What? Oh, yeah, sure, sure, I'll see him. Yeah, I'll, I'll see him in the office in ten minutes. I gotta go to the office. I guess you don't mind much. What's the matter? Oh, they're sending a striker over to give me their terms. Their terms. You're not going down there alone. <laughs> yeah, well, You can't do that. You mustn't. Why? Well, I... I don't want any trouble, Michael. Oh. <laughs> you know, for a second there, I thought you was thinking about me. I'll call you later. Who 
Those are the terms, Regan. They're waiting for me over at the meeting. Eight-hour day, two shifts, and a 25% raise in pay. Is that all? That's all. Don't you want my watch and chain, too? We don't want nothing that ain't ours by rights. Who framed that resolution? Griswold, I suppose. I ain't saying. Well, what's it going to be? You want my answer, huh? Yeah, and if it ain't the kind we like, we'll soak you all the harder later on. Well, come on, Regan. What do you say? I don't say nothing. My right hand does all my talking, and here's your answer now. Oh. Come on, get up, you sneaking tripe. And take my answer back to Griswold. Come on, get up, do you hear? What's the matter with you? Come on, do you hear me? Come. God. Michael. Shut that door. What are you doing down here? I told you. What happened? What did you do to him? Oh, they sent him over here and I hit him. Get some water. Yeah, Quick. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Did I, did I finish him? I don't know. Give me your handkerchief. What's that mark on his head? I didn't hit him there. He must have fallen against the desk. Oh, I hope you're proud of yourself, Michael. Oh, lay off, would you? I didn't mean to hit him that hard. I lost my head. Do you know this man? No, just that he was one of the men in the... Do you know anything about him? No. Well, I do. He was at the hospital last week when I went to see his wife. His wife? She's sick. She's dying. Dying? I didn't know that. I... What did they come here for? Why didn't they send someone else? Well, it's too late for that now. Yeah, yeah. Where's my wallet? Huh. What are you doing? Oh, just a couple of bills, that's all. I'll slip them in his pocket. I guess he didn't use them. I suppose you think that makes everything all right. Well, whether it does or not, it'll help, won't it? I didn't mean to hit him that hard. I lost my head. I... Oh, I knew this was going to happen. Michael. Listen. Michael Regan. Someone come up the steps. I gotta get this guy out of here. Michael. It's the Archbishop. The Archbishop. If he sees this, stole him for a minute. I gotta get this guy in the other office. Can you carry him alone? Yeah, sure, stole him. Michael. Come in, Your Grace. Well, Emily... I didn't expect to find you here. Where's Michael? He, he'll be right in. I tried to call him at home, but they said he was here. I've got to speak to him, Emily. Oh, yes, Your Grace, he... Well, well. Good evening, Father. I'm glad you're still here, Michael. Now, sit down, Your Grace, sit down. I... I haven't time. I'm on my way to the strikers' meeting in St. Mary's Hall. Strikers' meeting? Oh, now, you're not going to speak against me, Father. That's just what I've got to do. But Why? Young Griswold was talking to me this afternoon, and I see I've kept my mouth shut long enough. So I just stopped off on my way down for... Well, for the sake of old times, Mickey. To ask you if you won't give in before it's all too late. Give in and take a licking, huh? Yeah, you were never much good at that, were you? You are always the fightingest kid in the whole fourth ward. <laughs> I guess I was. <laughs> but remember, Mickey, whenever you'd go too far, I'd rise up in the name of righteousness and beat the very stoving out of you. Well, you was two years older than me. <laughs> and a blame side bigger, too. <laughs> oh, oh, Mickey. Yes, Father. I'll give it up, my son. Tell the men you'll give them what they want. They deserve it and... Oh, it's for your sake I'm asking, Mickey. And if I don't? I'll speak of this meeting tonight. I'll tell these strikers I'm behind them. I won't rest until I've struck you to the ground, my son, and I can do it. You know I can. All right. You've got me, Father. I'll give in. You mean it? Sure. If you go straight home from here without showing yourself or speaking at the hall, I'll send them word tomorrow morning that I'm down. And by Sunday, we'll have the terms all settled. You promise? Well, sure, I promise. I hope I can trust you, Michael. You can trust me like you trust yourself. All right. I won't go near that meeting tonight. That's all I wanted to know, Father. In a week, you'll have settled it for good? Just one week, and I'll settle it for good and all. Your Grace, do you hear that? Do you know what he means? What are you talking about? Why don't you shut I won't. up? I won't shut up. He's lied to you, Father. What? You're crazy. He's lied to you. He hasn't the least intention of giving up one inch to those strikers. Don't mind her, Father. She's off a nut. He's just fighting for time. Time, that's all he wants. A week? <laughs> Why, in a week, he's going to have 3,000 men here to take over the striker's job. Who told you that? Regan, is this true? Oh, she's crazy, I tell you. I've had a change of heart. I feel as, every one of, as if every one of them strikers was, was my brother. Your brother? <laughs> Open that door, Your Grace, and look into the next room. Shut up, The I man you'll see there brought the striker's ultimatum to this office tonight. He'll show you how my husband treats his brothers. Father, wait a second. Listen. Get out of my way. So you lied, Michael. You lied to me. It was an accident, Father. I didn't mean to hurt him. No? 
And you don't mean to keep your word about settling the strike? Well, we'll see about that. Wait a minute, Father. Where are you going? To St. Mary's Hall. No, Father, you can't do that. I can and I will. I'll talk to the citizens of this town as a priest has never talked to them before. Now get out of my way. Father, wait. You've heard these men speak to you? You've heard me. We've all told you that a strike is the only solution. The man whose one thought in this world is the welfare of his people. His grace, the archbishop. Hello, are you still there? Well, listen, Porky. Take down everything he says, everything. Then call me here at home. Yeah, yeah. Michael? Oh, come on in. I've taken care of that man. Well, how is he? He'll be all right. Well, then that's okay. Yes. You did a good job. Yeah? You didn't do so bad yourself. The archbishop is down there at that meeting speaking against me now. That's pretty good, too. Turning against your own husband. <laughs> Trying to soak him everywhere you could. Oh, that's not true. I did it for you. Yeah, ain't I treated you well? Ain't I done everything I thought you wanted, big and small? And I kept out of your way as much as I could, sneaking in at the back door night after night, taking off my shoes when I went upstairs, beating it from, from a room whenever I heard you coming. I've tried to make living here easy for you, and it's been no cinch for a man like me. No cinch, I'll tell you. And that's the truth. And now what do I get? You lie low, waiting for the chance when you see I'm breathing hard and scrapping with both hands, you up and stick a knife in my... Stop back. it! Stop well, it! Well, it is so. Wait. Listen. There's something I want to say. I've hung on to myself for six months now. I've done my duty by you the way we agreed and shut my eyes to everything else. But I've come to the end. I spoke out tonight because I couldn't help it. Do you hear? I couldn't help it. And I'll go on that way. Unless you give up this shameful fight. Give up? I don't know how. Then I'm through with you, do you hear? I'm through with you. Hello. Oh, I've been a fool. I've been a fool even to hope oh, that it might... Oh, shut up. I can't hear. Hello, Porky. Did he speak in? What did he say? Yeah? Yeah? Hmm. I suppose they're walking out on me, huh? Leave me flat, huh? <laughs> What's all that noise? Cheering. Cheering, huh? <laughs> Cheering. Michael. Oh, Michael. Oh, go away. Go on. Beat it and let me alone. Come in. A uh, telegram for Mr. Regan. A telegram. Give it to me. Give it to me. What is it? <laughs> Michael. What is it? What's the matter? <laughs> it's the Western. They've canceled my contracts. <laughs> and they've gone back at me. Now I am finished. I'm smashed. <laughs> Go on. Tell me you're glad. Go on. Get it off your chest. And laugh. Why don't you laugh? Go on. <laughs> Don't be scared. I can't hurt you. I can't hurt nobody anymore. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the second act of our drama comes to its close. Our stars will be back in a moment, though, to continue this story of a mismated man and woman. Into the Lux Radio Theater now steps a lady internationally known for her advice on matters of marriage. Her name is Dorothy Dix. You've doubtless read her famous column that's syndicated in newspapers the world over. At the moment, she's sitting in the study of her home in New Orleans behind a carved oak desk, across which the troubles of millions of persons have come to her. Miss Dix has just recently celebrated her 41st anniversary of the Dorothy Dix column, and yet that study is just as full of life, of interest, and of compassion as ever before. Tonight, for the first time in her life, she speaks over the radio. We're honored to welcome her on the air, and it's my privilege to extend the stage of the Lux Radio Theater to her now. 
Miss Dorothy Dick speaks to you from New Orleans. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. True, this is my first experience in speaking over the radio. And I feel that I'm a little advanced in life to undertake an active role in that very young field. Usually, I just listen. And as a listener, I've enjoyed many of your Lux plays. They're as fine in the field of entertainment as your Lux soap is in the field of beauty. Your play this evening interests me particularly. I have never heard the boss before, and I don't know how his problem is going to work out. However, I've known many Michaels and Emilys, though their problems have varied in a thousand ways from the one we find in this particular drama. Although it is not possible to cover uncongenial marriage with one blanket of advice, I do want to say something about husbands and wives who find themselves at odds with each other. All their dreams of happiness shattered and who attempted to call marriage a failure and throw up their hands and quit cold. I contend that this is nearly always a mistake and that there are very few marriages, even if they have gone on the rocks, that cannot be salvaged. How would you do this? Of course, there is no foolproof recipe for making a marriage a success, but there are a lot of things you can do that will help to keep one a going concern. And my first suggestion is not to be in too great a hurry to buy a ticket to Reno. Give your marriage a chance to jail. Don't call it off before you've made an honest try of it. It takes a lot of time for any business to get on its feet and for partners to learn to adjust themselves to each other. Many a business that tottered on the verge of bankruptcy has, in the end, made millions for those who had the grit to stick to it and see it through. And many a marriage that gets off to a bad start finishes in a glorious burst of happiness. My second suggestion is treat your husband or wife as you would like to be treated. If you crave affection, be a great lover yourself. If you hunger for appreciation, never forget to show it. My third suggestion is look for the virtues of the one to whom you are married and shut your eyes to his or her faults. There is a lot of self-hypnotism in love, and we can find in our mates what we want to find if we try hard enough. Don't forget that an ounce of tact will go farther than a ton of arguments and reproaches. And hold fast to the thought that husbands and wives do fall in love with each other, and many disgruntled ones find a happy solution to their difficulties. And if all of your efforts to make a happy marriage fail, still you profit, because you have enriched your soul and fortified your character. You have not cheated yourself out of all that is good and strong and rich in life by turning quitter. These thoughts I leave with you. I'm happy to have talked with you, and I will now join you as a listener. For I, too, want to know how the boss is going to solve his problem. For your three suggestions, Miss Dix, accept our gratitude. We are back now in Hollywood, presenting Edward Arnold, Fay Ray, and H.B. Warner in The Boss. It's early the following morning, and Mike Regan has rallied himself for a last desperate effort. He and Porky McCoy are in a car, touring slowly through the town, on the lookout for fresh activities of the strikers. You oughtn't to be here, boss. If we run into any of that mob, they'll shut Shut up, Porky. I know what I'm doing. Yeah? I wish I was sure of that. Hey, look. Stop the car. There they are, boss. The whole mob of them. They're heading for the plants. That's Griswold with them, ain't it? Looks like him. He's taking them there for a meeting. He's trying to bust me on the home grounds, eh? Let me out, boss. I'll round up a couple of the old gang and we'll... No, no, no rough stuff. Okay, boss. But we ought to know what they're going to do. They might start... All right, take it easy. I'll be at the house if you want me. Okay, boss. I'll call you up the first thing. Right.
Michael? Hello, Emily. I've been waiting for you all morning. What for? To tell me you're sorry? Yes. Well, you don't have to. I don't need your sympathy. Not until I'm licked. You mean you're still going to fight? Still? <laughs> I'm just starting. And it's going to be a swell show. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn the grain traffic from this town to Montreal. What? Yeah. I sent a wire last night to the shoreline, offer them half present rates if they'd unload at Montreal. I'm waiting for an answer now. Half rate? But, but will it pay? Hey, who wants to make it pay? All I want to do is get back at this town, and that's what I'm going to do. I'll show this town. I'll strip it clean. What do you mean? I got over six million invested in this place, and when I skip, my dough skips with me. You see? No, I don't see. I don't see at all. Well, then listen to this. A lot of that dough is in mortgages, overdue mortgages. Michael. Yeah. And before I leave here, I foreclose on every one of them. You wouldn't. Now watch me. Whose mortgages are they? Oh, just little ones down around Lake Street. Lake Street? Why, that's... That's Shantytown. Sure, what about it? Well, what's going to happen to those men? The men you've employed for years. You mean the men that started a strike and beat me? They're going to lose their happy homes. That's what'll happen to them. Michael, you can't. They're the people that need you. You can't ruin them just to satisfy your own miserable little idea of revenge. Yeah, that's it, revenge. I'm going to squeeze them until I hear their bones cracking. You won't. You won't, Michael. I married you only to help those people. And I'm not going to see my sacrifice go for nothing. Well, how are you going to help it? Well, I don't know. I don't know anything except that, that I'm your wife. And you can't do this. I'm your wife. My wife? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, that is. I guess if you was my wife, I might act different. You say you feel sorry for them strikers. Well, let me tell you right now, there's not one of them that ain't got more than I have. He's got someone to love him. What have I got? Nothing. Michael, listen to me. I'm sorry for everything. Really, I am. I should never have married you with... with those conditions. But I'll change now. I'll be different. Different? Don't you want me to, Michael? Emily, do you have to ask me that? Sure, I want All to... right, then. I will. Emily. But you'll have to give up this idea of yours. Oh, uh, yeah? You've got to leave those people alone. Oh, so it's another bargain you're making. Is that it? No, it isn't. Yes, it is. You're driving another bargain just like you did the last time. Do you think I want you if that's how you come to me? Do you think I'll take my wife that way? Michael. I won't have you, see? If you don't come to me of your own free will, I don't want you at all. No, you're wrong. It is of my own. Who is it? Uh, Mr. McCoy to see you, Mr. Regan. I can't see him now. He says it's important, sir. He seems rather upset. Yeah? Well, what did he... All right, send him in. In the library. Yes, sir. I'll speak to you later, Emily. Boss. All right, Porky, what's on your mind? Boss, it's... It's about young Griswold. Yeah, well, come on, come on, spill it. He got the crowd down to the plant, boss. He got up on a barrel and sailed into you. Said he was going to lick you. Call you all the dirty names you could think of. I... I guess I sort of went off my nut and I... Well, go on, go on. I... I heaved something at him, a, a bottle. I heaved it and it caught him in the head. What? He went down. What happened then? Tell me, is he I all right? I don't know, he... They took him into Dugan's cafe. Then the ambulance came and got him. You fool! I didn't mean to do it. Honest, I didn't. But they're coming down here, boss. The whole crowd of them. They're heading this way, and I... Shut up and listen to me. Did anyone see you throw that bottle? No. It was all looking at him. I was on the outside of the crowd. Then it's all right. Go home to your wife and kid and keep your mouth shut. Do you understand? If there's any trouble, I'll take care of you. Ah, gee, thanks, Mike. I knew you'd fix it up for me. Go on, get out the back way. I'll take care of you. Oh, Emily, I, I want to talk to you. Michael, what's the matter? What do you mean? Look out of the window. That crowd of strikers. What do they want? Well, it's, it's all right. Just take it easy. They found out about the mortgage. No, no, it's nothing like that. Sit down and uh, I'll tell you about it. What is it? Tell me. Well, it's about your brother. What's happened to him? Well, he went down to the plant to talk to the men. Well? And uh, he was saying some rotten stuff about me and they began firing things. Porky says it was a bottle that caught him in the head. They got him in the hospital as quick as they could. Oh, you did it. You told them to do it. Emily, oh. you don't believe that. 
You don't believe I've done a thing like that. No, you don't. You can't. Don't. Oh, I never no. knew a thing about it till Porky told me. I wouldn't have had it happen for anything. Oh, Emily, listen to me. I got the whole town lined up against me. I'm all alone. But if you will believe me, Emily, I don't care. And I will be different, too, from now on. I'll be as different as I know how. I'll throw up the Montreal deal. I won't foreclose any mortgages. I'll do anything you want me to if you'll only believe me. Emily. Don't touch me. Emily. Don't get near me. Oh, you don't think I've done it. You don't. You did it. <laughs> I know you did it. <laughs> oh, but just a moment. Get Inspector. out of the way. Mr. Regan? Yeah. I'm Inspector Kennedy from police headquarters. I've got a warrant here for your arrest. You'll have to come along, Regan. Well, can you wait a minute, please? Just a minute. <laughs> Emily. Emily, listen to me. I didn't do it, so help me God, I didn't. <laughs> Emily. All right, Inspector. I'm ready now. Michael, why didn't you tell them the truth? They'd let you out of here right now if... If I turned around, turned around and blamed some poor sucker who don't know any better? No, Your Grace, I'm the guy that's responsible. I'm the guy that's taken the rap. That's the way it is, and that's the way it's going to stand. And still I say you didn't do it. Oh, what makes you so sure? Because I know who did. Oh, you do? Yes, a priest comes to know these things, Michael, even though he can't speak of them. Well, what of it? It's a fine sacrifice you're making, my son, but it may turn out to be greater than you think. You mean if Griswold dies, huh? Yes, Michael. Yeah, I know. They'll hang me high in the kite. So, what? Hawk, he's got a wife, he's got a kid, he's got everything to lose. And you? Me? <laughs> I never had anything to begin with. Michael, if you won't help yourself, there's nothing I can do for you. That's right. I don't want any help. I don't want anything, Father. Very well, my son. Oh, Father, uh, wait. There is just one thing. Yes? I'd like to see Emily again. Would you ask her to come? I guess... I don't guess she'll do it, but... I'd like to see her just once. Very well. Name, please. I... I'm Mrs. Regan. There was supposed to be a pass for me here. Yes, ma'am. Here you are. The guard will show you to his cell. Thank you. Any chance yet, officer? You'll have to wait, McCoy. McCoy? Oh, hello, Mrs. Regan. Are you waiting to see him too, Porky? Well, no. No, ma'am, I, I ain't. This way, Mrs. Regan. Thank you. Five minutes, Mrs. Regan. Emily. How are you, Michael? Oh, I'm all right. I'm glad to see you, Emily. Did the Archbishop tell you... I that... haven't seen the Archbishop. Huh? No, I've been at the hospital since yesterday. Oh. Well, I, I wanted to see you, Emily. It's... Well, it's about those mortgages. Yes? I thought I'd deed them over to you, if you didn't mind. Deed them over to me? But I, I thought you were going to foreclose. Uh, I changed my mind. Why? Oh, I don't know. When you're up against it the way I am now, you sort of feel of, feel like squaring everything up. And I thought seeing you was so interesting to those men down there, you'd like to keep an eye on them and see that they don't get into trouble. <laughs> They're just like kids, you know. I guess they need someone to look after them. Oh, Michael. Will you do it then? Oh, that's fine. I I'll fix the papers up tomorrow. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's all right. Well, you're the boss now, Emily. The boss of Shantytown, eh? Um, <laughs> ah, I guess you'll be a better one than me. Are you going to Montreal soon? Montreal? No, no. I guess I ain't going any place for a long time yet. You mean on account of Don? Yeah. Well, then you don't know. Know what? Well, it's all right. He's going to get well. Is he? Yes, that's what the doctor says. He, he operated at 2 o'clock. Don knew me before I left the hospital. Oh, gee, I'm glad. I'm awful glad, Emily. <laughs> so you can probably 
go to Montreal after all. Yeah, I suppose I can, but somehow I guess I won't. You're giving that up, too? Well, it looks that way. But why? You don't have to. Can't I do a decent thing sometimes just for the fun of it? Just for the fun of it? Well, I ain't doing it for any other reason. You've changed. Me? No. I'm just the same as I always was. Well, then I've changed. Because everything looks looks different to me now, Michael. I, I'm sorry I didn't believe you about Don. Oh, what's the difference? You've done so many things, and, and I knew how you felt about Don. And when you told me, it all seemed to go together. I couldn't oh, think... don't but... begin that again, please. <laughs> but now it's all right. I, I'm sure now. I know you didn't do it. You believe me? Yes, I do. And you've got to forgive me for not believing you oh, before. Oh, it, Dawn. But I'll make up for it. You'll see. I'll make up for it, I promise. You mean you... No, oh, no, Emily. I know you're just saying it to make things easy for me, but... Oh, no, I'm not. Sure, yeah. We can't pick it up now. We've got to start all over, only this time we've got to start alone. Why? We were all wrong, Emily, right from the beginning. I was wrong in thinking I could ever make you happy, and you was wrong in thinking you could ever let oh, me try. Oh, don't. Please, People don't. People have to love each other awful hard before they can get married. If you and me had done that, well, I guess everything would have been all right. But as it is, Michael. all the bills paid, the accounts all closed. If there's any forgiving to be done, I guess I'll do my share. I hope God gives you all the things you never could get from me, Emily. I hope you'll live happy. Good luck to you, Emily. Goodbye. Mr. Regan? Yeah. That man, McCoy. What about him? He just spilled the whole thing. Went in to see the inspector and made an affidavit, saying that he threw the bottle and you had nothing to do with it. McCoy said that? Yes, ma'am. So you're all right, Regan. Officer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, would you call my chauffeur? I'm... I'm going to take my husband home. Sure, Mrs. Regan. Emily. Michael, is that your overcoat? Yeah, but... Well, here, put it on. And be sure to button it up. It's chilly out. And your hat. Oh, wait. <laughs> I'll show you how you'll have to wear it now. <laughs> Not tilt t- t- it over your eye like that, Michael. <laughs> straight. Or almost straight, anyway. <laughs> you mean like this? Yes, like that. That's fine. Now, take it off. Why? I just put it on. Oh, Michael. Do you think I'm going to let you kiss me with it on? Emily. Oh, gee. That, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our presentation of The Boss and paves the way for a personal meeting with Edward Arnold and Fay Ray. Many thanks, Mr. DeMille. It's such a pleasure to be here, and it gives me another opportunity to thank the sponsors of this program for their wonderful product. Here in Hollywood, where a girl has to be most careful about her complexion, Lux Soap is indeed a friend. I know I wouldn't think of using anything else. You know, that's very kind of you, Fay, and I, I thank you I, I've heard you're something of a poet. And I believe our audience would like to hear one of your efforts. Well, I'm not so sure you should be so sure. <laughs> you know, my career as an amateur poet began and ended when I was 14. While other kids were playing cops and robbers, I was writing poems. But after I saw one published, well, <laughs> let's talk about Eddie. You know, I'm worried about you, Eddie. Haven't you been well? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm marvelous, why? <laughs> you... <laughs> Well, you, you, you seem a little thinner than the last time you were here. Yes. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> are you uh, reducing for a new picture? <laughs> no, it's not that. Well, but you certainly are thinner. <laughs> well, if, if you must know, it's because my wife is away. Yeah. <laughs> She's in New York, uh, in New York doing some, some concert singing, and until she returns, well, I'm doing the cooking. <laughs> <laughs> I've always understood that uh, you're an excellent cook. They tell me your sour broughton and potato dumplings are a symphony in calories. <laughs> it's really nothing but a hobby to me, cooking. Just like Faye here writes poetry. Oh. <laughs> of course, anybody can write poetry. Oh, oh, but sorry. sour broughton and potato dumplings, ah. Well, now, <laughs> if your old sour broughton is so good, what's the recipe? I bet you don't even know how to cook it. Oh, yeah? 
I'll not only tell you how, but what's more, just to prove how easy it is to write poetry, I'll do it in rhyme. I dare you. All right, here it goes. Now, the little, the title of this poem is Zauerbra. <laughs> I tossed it off one day after eating some of my own sauerbraten, so blame it on the cooking if you want to. Of all the things that man has begotten, what is more grand than sauerbraten? Especially when you serve it in those dumplings made of potatoes. I'm sure my teeth have never sodden a tastier dish than sauerbraten. So it tastes like food and not like water. Soak the meat in a bucket of water, and just to be sure it's especially nice, add a cup full of vinegar and a thimble full of spice. The reason why it is sometimes tough is because many people don't soak it enough. Let it soak for three days or four at the most. Then cook in the oven like you cook a pot roast. Now for the dumplings made of spuds, in order that you won't be duds. And for the best results from a boiled potato, boil them first and peel them later. <laughs> After they've cooled, they'll look much nicer if you slice them through a potato slicer. Then drop them into a batter consisting of pepper and salt and flour and mixing. It's not essential, but if you like to putter, slip in some croutons fried in butter. Back to the pot, the whole thing goes. Batter, croutons, potatoes. There to boil, bubble, bubble, bubble. Potato dumplings are an awful lot of trouble. But what tastes better if you've cooked them right? There's nothing more tender and nothing more light. You can have your squab. You can have your mutton. Please pass those dumplings and sour brutton. By Edward Arnold, the end. And now you know why I don't write poetry. <laughs> Good night, CB. Good night. Good night, poet. <laughs> A very important announcement about next week's play in Stars comes from Mr. DeMille shortly. Heard in tonight's drama were Howard Phillips as Donald Griswold, Frank Shannon as Porky McCoy, Wright Kramer as Mr. Griswold, Eric Wilton as Mitchell, Earl Gunn as Scanlon, Lou Merrill as the inspector, Frank Nelson as Davis, David Kerman as Dave, Sidney Newman as Gates, Eddie Kane as an officer, and Ross Forrester as a newsboy. Mr. Arnold appeared through courtesy of B.P. Schulberg and Louis Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he directed music for the new film Sally, Irene, and Mary. Back now to our producer. Last January, the Lux Radio Theater was honored with the presence of one of the greatest actors of our generation, who chose our stage as the scene of his first dramatic performance on the air. We are proud to announce that he has acceded to your many requests for a return engagement. So next Monday night, we present Mr. George Arliss, accompanied by his lovely wife, Florence Arliss, and an all-star cast. Mr. Ellis will reenact his memorable screen portrayal, The Man Who Played God, an inspiring drama of a sensitive man fighting to overcome a physical handicap and find his rightful place in society. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents George Arliss in The Man Who Played God with Florence Arliss. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.